So I'm Susan Whitmer, and I am principal at Susan Whitmer Studios in Florida. And I started my journey um, right out of college um, with a degree in interior design. And I went to work for a company called Herman Miller, which is a commercial furniture company. And basically started in their um, distribution channel and moved on after a few years to their corporate offices. Um, it really was 40 years of continuous learning and um, given opportunities to learn through the healthcare sector, the facilities management for corporation um, sector, and eventually into education. And I was very fortunate with Herman Miller to be with a company that valued um, lifelong learning and education. So I had a great opportunity to earn two master's degrees, one of which is in accessibility and inclusive design. And I um, joined the education team at Herman Miller in 2005 and started my journey into learning spaces. Uh, and it, around applied research. So our research was always um, grounded in understanding the lived experiences of the user. So that means that um, all of the um, solutions that we eventually came to, we recognized that there were patterns in the way that throughout the lifelong learning journey, patterns in the way that um, users carry out their work. So whether it's pre-K to gray, um, there were patterns of um, ways that people do their work that informed how we uh, create great spaces for them to work and learn. Um, and this carried out through all of the learning spaces research that we did. Um, just making sure that we're paying attention always to that lived experience um, of the student. So that's my story. Well, uh, I, and I was happy to intersect with your story, Susan, and uh, eventually um, my learning spaces journey has been mostly as a teacher uh, and later as an administrator. Uh, before I was a college teacher, um, I was a long time ago a preschool teacher for a couple of years. And um, I guess it's in retrospect, it's sort of the, one of those like everything I know, you know, I learned in kindergarten or everything I know about learning spaces, I learned in preschool or as a preschool teacher in retrospect, because I had a, a really great uh, mentor teacher who, who used a kind of some a hybrid Montessori with other um, pedagogies in her uh, system. And the system involved uh, teachers coming in an hour before class and rearranging the room every day. So the, the, the space was flexible and reconfigurable. Um, she had um, partitions hung with, uh, clothes, with clothes pins. And our job was every day to go and change the spaces every single day. And once a week, we would change major aspects of the space, like move the piano or the dramatic play area or something like this. This is some preschool three to five-year-olds. And um, the, each space that we created, we had to define how many humans it was for, little humans. And we had to define what the learning purpose was. And we had to document that on index cards. And um, she had principles too for designing those, the, those learning experiences each day. Uh, the overall principle was familiar things in unfamiliar places and unfamiliar things in familiar places. And so, you know, there we document, you put the bristle blocks with the rubber bands and try to suggest what might be happening there and you document the learning goal, small motor skills, or dramatic, you know, social skills, or and so on. Um, and the result, seeing the results of that was amazing because the kids would come into the room each day and the parents, and they were so excited. 
about the learning that was going to happen. And they would just go around the room all around because it was always different and, and, and figure out what was going on each day. Anyway, um, uh, I, I didn't know at that time I would later become a college teacher um, and be um, involved with designing learning spaces. But I, I, I learned so much from Barbara um, in that. And when I um, did start teaching, um, we got a, this was um, eventually at Stanford and we got a grant from Apple in the late eighties to design a computer classroom and construct a computer lab. And we got the opportunity to design one of the first classrooms, computer classrooms uh, that was designed by teachers instead of by technologists. Uh, so, so, so we arranged that room in similar, you know, to be reconfigurable, to be flexible. We said, no, we're not putting the computers in rows. We're putting them around the perimeter and we're having flexible seminar seating around the middle that can be separated in for group work. So uh, we got to think about um, design aspects that affected, uh, impacted learning and teaching modalities and, and it, in different ways of uh, 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 of learning and teaching. So also uh, at that time, we were integrating technology affordances and trying to, and, and thinking about the beginning, the early days of blended and hybrid learning. How does the technology and remote and network stuff relate to what happens in the physical classroom? Um, then uh, later I became an administrator and I, uh, I guess had the experience of, you know, more looking at planning, operations, support, a system-wide perspective. Uh, how do we extend that technology-rich space that I had experience teaching in? Uh, how do we extend those across campus? Uh, and then, you know, start working with other colleagues uh, and meet met people like Susan at conferences and, uh, and, and learn so much from those experiences and the learning space rating system that we probably talk about later grew out of those uh, collaborations with other, um, with other uh, colleagues around the country. I really wanted to focus on two things, equity and inclusion. Uh, at, like many people, I said that this time um, in conversations with students and, and other organizations. And a lot of the discussions were around, you know, the equity portion of what happened um, during this pandemic um, and how it was really illuminated that um, there is disparity, um, especially when you think about technologies um, and the the technology that was available to students as they immediately had to um, work remotely and um, the issues around Wi-Fi. So I think that um, during the process that's been recognized and there's a lot of, of institutions and organizations that are working with their communities to um, mitigate those issues. Um, so that the next time we have um, an event that it, it won't um, be, uh, the challenges won't be um, the way they were in this time. Um, so it is about um, making sure that everyone has access to the technologies that they need, but also the um, experiences of being able to toggle from physical space to remote space, because if you think about it, um, although it's much easier for some than for others, there are always times when someone is sick, um, someone may have a parent they're taking care of or children they're taking care of. And if um, during these flexible times um, that people can uh, work either remotely or, or learn remotely or in um, on the campus. We want to make sure that those technologies and, and access to Wi-Fi and things like that are available um, and not just toggle the technology that's toggled to the campus. Um, the campus. Um, so I thought that was really important. And then the second part of that is inclusion. 
And a couple of things, uh, interesting things came out of um, thinking about inclusion. One, I think it was when the campuses began to shut down around March 16th, um, we found that there were many students who were um, uh, stuck on campus because of multiple reasons. One, they may be international students. We had students maybe who were attending um, university from a, across the country, right, from where their home is. Or they may have moved out of their home and really couldn't go back to it. So those students were um, a bit isolated on the campuses because they had to stay in their dorms and um, so if we can um, really do a better job with communication and, and sort of the, um, the planning portion of this, uh, not to say that everyone did a bad job, that's not what I'm saying, but I, I think there, there was some learning there that moving forward that we can think about that better and what the planning process is going to be around that. And then the other thing that I heard um, were from students who said that they really wish they had been involved in the conversations about the move to remote learning um, because they're concerned about um, really how they make the transition because not everyone makes the transition in the same way. So um, including them in those conversations because I have found that if you include students in conversations, they feel less excluded in the whole process. Um, so I think that that was um, something that we learned that maybe we can do better moving forward in, in many different instances and events. So um, the equity and inclusion portion of that I thought was very important um, in, in how we think about planning that physical digital remote um, uh, learning. So if we're actually learning anywhere, anytime. So, Rich, what do you have to add to that? Well, I, all that is just really spot on, uh, I think. And, you know, I'm thinking that in one sense, um, the challenges and opportunities that we're facing post COVID are the same challenges and opportunities that we faced pre COVID, but that uh, COVID just really uh, threw into stark relief, uh, shined a bright light, light on, on, uh, uh, on some of these things. Yeah. Um, for example, the limitations of remote learning. Suddenly faculty were you know, thrown, forced, uh, kicking and screaming. To, now you're gonna you know, do, you know, learn this stuff that we were trying to show you before and, and a lot of it was not done very well. And so the, the, and, uh, some of it can't be done well. And so, so that became really obvious. The inequities uh, that you mentioned are thrown into starker relief. Um, and so one thing uh, to me is that, that um, uh, there's this great opportunity to revisit what are the special things about the built environment? What are the special things about face-to-face -face learning? Because, you know, people missed it. People said, oh man, this sucks. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there were good things about it too, of course. And there, um, but um, uh, so, you know, it, it's a fresh chance to make the argument that here's what's here's what's important about the face-to-face uh, -face environment, and what can we uh, what can we do there? And 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 the essential questions are, to me, are still the same, which is what is best done remotely, and with which specific tools, depending on what your learning and teaching purpose is, which tool is appropriate for which which medium is appropriate, which modality is appropriate to use to do different learning activities. When I was teaching, uh, uh, I found that electronic discussion, that is asynchronous electronic discussion was a transformative uh, technology. And I was you know, teaching a face-to-face -face classroom. 
because the li there's a lot of limitations and uh, to um, uh, uh, to uh, face to face discussion and in so far as people are impacted by all these social cues. It's not very democratic. Men talk more than women. Men interrupt women. Um, you know, uh, people are thinking about who they're going to date, what people look like. And then when you put, you know, and you complement face to face with electronic discussion, you get, you know, something greater than the sum of the two. Anyway, all those questions are thrown into, I think, into sharp relief now at this time, and including how do we make both that online experience and the face to face experience more inclusive because inclusion and in DEI, as Susan, as you're talking about, has widely taken hold as a priority in higher ed and as an institutional value, not just in higher ed, but as a strong institutional value is driving all kinds of things on campus. So how do learning spaces and how did learning space design align with those, uh, with those institutional values, how can we uh, 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 enhance those efforts? I would agree. I would say the first thing is know your students. Um, know their lived experiences, not just the demographics that show up in a spreadsheet. So I'm gonna refer a little bit to um, a panel discussion from AACNU that Jeannie and I both um, have uh, participated in one way or the other. Uh, and, and it really is about shifting our mindset away from this traditional model of categories and silos to the possibilities that exist in a culture that values equity, diversity, inclusion, and human dignity. Um, and, and we, I feel very strongly that that's important. So one of the things means that we have to move away from the, this notion of the average student because the average student does not exist. We know that. Um, there, there are so many um, unique lived experiences that our students bring to campus with them. Um, and that are whether we recognize it now or not, are being valued um, by employers more and more every year. So one of those is, um, an example, is uh, students who are neurodiverse. So neurodiversity um, refers to the natural range of variations of human neurocognition. And it, it really is a broader umbrella that encompasses students on the autism spectrum um, with dyslexia, dysplasia, ADHD, ADD. Um, uh, so those are just um, uh, different, uh, in, in probably some instances referred to as learning disabilities, but I see them more as just not neurotypical, so they're neurodiverse. Um, well, the fact of the matter is 15 to 20 percent of our population is neurodiverse. And um, there are a lot of employee employers that are now really valuing what neurodiverse employees bring to, um, to the organizations. And they're actually recruiting them. So I think it, it's our job um, to make sure that we have equity and in making sure that those students get the same access um, to our best, our best educational experiences um, that they deserve. And um, it's also important for us to think about um, veterans with PTSD, thinking about um, our students who are LBGTQ, uh, and thinking about students who have food insecurities, housing insecurities, first generation. So when you put all of these things together, um, and, and there are some statistics like um, 30 to 50 percent of the students on our campuses at some point during their academic career have food insecurities. Um, students in two-year institutions 
30% um, of those students have housing insecurities and 14% are homeless. And then in the four-year institutions, it ranges from 11 to 14%. But when you think of, these are things we don't typically think about um, as we're planning um, our, our campus and how we can um, provide access, um, which is part of an equitable experience, is providing access um, to enrich the, the lives of these students. And um, it also uh, so alleviates a lot of that cognitive stress and the mental stress in, in being a student on campus. So I, I really want us to think a lot about um, really getting to know our students. And, and that was what a lot of our research has been about over the past few years is making sure that um, we really understand that um, experience of the student. So a couple of practices that I think about around that are um, legibility and permeability. So legibility is being able to easily navigate the campus. If you think about um, the daily life of a student on campus, and um, if you are a student who um, spatially uh, may struggle a bit with spatial concepts, so you, you, um, we need to have clear, uh, easy to navigate pathways and walkways throughout campus um, using wayfinding. So wayfinding can be something like a statue, it can be cultural artifacts, it can be um, physical cues like uh, digital dashboards, whether it's interior or exterior, um, that really uh, help the student navigate. And if you can navigate, and if you feel comfortable um, in a place, you are gonna have a greater sense of belonging and a greater sense of community. And it is gonna really enhance the learning experience. So um, being able to navigate and making sure our campuses are legible, both interior and exterior. So the interior spaces also need to be legible. And then permeability is um, really just the ability to pass through. Um, so as we're going through spaces or we're taking um, classes, um, an example of a permeable space is uh, those spaces that we're creating in corridors, right? So when you leave class, um, there may be a space where you can just uh, drop down and uh, uh, do some classwork or, or have a conversation, follow up conversation with a faculty member or um, any of those kinds of engagements. Uh, those spaces are really important. And then um, how do we, and this is both physical and digital. So uh, a good example of that is, um, and I think a, an institution that had really started this work in advance of COVID, uh, which helped them a lot, was Arizona State University has done a really good job in creating um, platforms, digital platforms, where their students can, um, that the learning really permeates like throughout um, the entire experience, whether they're, they're on campus or off campus. Um, so those kinds of environments are really important. Um, being able to, uh, uh, another platform it, that they were using is Slack. So Slack, again, it gives them the opportunity. They can have group conversations. They can chat with their um, professors. Um, so, so the technology, I think, is going to help a lot with that permeability aspect of it. And when you think about um, examples of permeability, um, that, that are really important to an inclusive environment, um, I think a lot about um, sensory spaces. So a sensory space could and should be, um, I'm hoping one day we have sensory space in every uh, building, but it should be uh, close to classrooms so that let's say you have a, a student who is has PTSD or maybe um, neurodivergent and has um, sometimes they're, uh, they have heightened sensitivity 
to activities going on and change, um, which makes, re, makes me think back to when we first started talking about active learning spaces. It was about, you know, you could really make changes and get into group work and then, you know, switch um, processes and things like that. For a student with PTSD or a student who is neurodiverse, that sometimes can be um, unsettling for them. So if you have these um, sensory spaces, which are just quiet, so they're acoustically sound, um, they have lighting that is very soothing, and they can just take a break, go to that space, just in, in reset, and then get up and go back and join the um, activities that they were involved in. And that is so much better than them deciding to drop a class or to leave school or something like that. If we, if we provide those kinds of, um, I don't wanna call them accommodations because that's not really what it is because I don't know about you, but there's been many times when I wish I had a sensory space to go to just to hit reset um, and just calm myself down. So um, those sensory spaces, I think, are going to be very important to us in the future. And, and there are, are um, lots of research out there that support that. Um, and then one last uh, uh, notion on this is, uh, this is anecdotal, but in, in our research at the Georgia Tech Clough Commons, we uh, did a lot of observation. And one of those was noticing that international students were going into um, these stairwells to have FaceTime calls with their family. And that was the place that they felt um, safest to just you know, talk in their own languages and engage with their family. Well, these aren't very pleasant spaces. These aren't the stairwells in the middle of the atrium. They were the back stairwells. And that really struck me as that's what, I can't imagine that you feel very included in your community if you are having to do that. And so um, the type of space that a sensory space is can also apply to helping the, the students who may be culturally um, diverse be able to acclimate and be able to feel like that they have a sense of belonging um, on the campus. So I thought that was really important. Interesting thing is, a couple of years later, I had a conversation with um, a leader at the University of Texas system, and we were talking about these stories, and he acknowledged that he has seen the exact same thing on campuses um, in their system. So he, that really validated for me that that's a real thing. That really does happen. So it's something that we ought to focus on. Um, and I think the uh, I'll, I'll stop for a minute, let Rich talk for a minute, and then I have uh, one more that I'll talk about on uh, making use of real estate, better use of real estate. Great. Well, yeah, I mean, fantastic design ideas. Um, and um, the, the notion of having students be involved in these discussions and planning and design is, is you know, is key having your students involved. Um, so um, so I'll talk a little bit about the learning space rating system. Uh, version three that we just released is um, a, a lot of the motivation for doing version three was around inclusion uh, and that creating that sense of belonging and so on that, you know, that, that we're talking about. Um, and just real quickly, the, the LSRS, as, as we call it, is a rating system like um, sort of like the well building standards or the lead standards, which um, measure features of the built environment that impact health, features of the built environment that impact the environment. In our case, the learning space rating system measures um, features of the built environment that impact learning, essentially, and that facilitate multiple modalities of learning and teaching. And that's 
uh, a key part of the inclusion thing which Susan's talking about neurodiversity and so on that multiple modalities is key to addressing that. So our question is how do you apply this specifically to learning spaces and really the LSRS focuses on formal spaces, so AKA classrooms. Um, and it's a set of, of uh, a best practices, a common language and taxonomy that attempts to sort of quantify these different um, uh, aspects of design. So there's, there's two parts. Uh, the first part is about the campus context, planning, support, uh, operations and so on. And there are several sections in there, integrating with campus context, planning and design, support and operations. And then the second part is about this stuff that goes sort of the design of actual spaces. So uh, environmental quality, layout and furnishings, technology and tools. And then there's a dedicated section on inclusion. And we think that inclusion permeates many of the other uh, sections too, but we wanted to call it out because to start a conversation um, with our uh, colleagues and practitioners and researchers uh, to say, well, here's some measurable things. You can get points for doing these things to make a space more inclusive, a physical space, uh, more inclusive, create a sense of belonging and so on. So um, the framework that we use um, in the LSRS for inclusion, oh, and, and first of all, I think it's really important to note that how do you create a sense of belonging, a welcoming and inclusive classroom experience? Well, the vast majority of how you do that is that the teaching, the pedagogy, it's all about the teaching. And so, you can meet in a gymnasium, you can meet in a forest, you can meet in a basement. The, how inclusive the environment is, is mostly dependent on teachers and, you know, teacher development and, 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 and how, you know, and how they go about that. So uh, the physical space, uh, the idea is let's help that. What are some ways that we can use research that exists to, um, to um, make that easier? Um, just like uh, Susan mentioned, active learning, like we try to design spaces that facilitate active learning. You can do active learning in a crappy classroom, but it's just harder. And so, so the same thing applies, I think, to uh, in inclusion. So the framework that we use is three perspectives on, in on inclusion. Um, physical inclusion and accessibility. Um, Cognitive, and we call it cognitive inclusion, which is what Susan's talking about, neurodiversity is, is, is part of that, and cultural inclusion. So I'll just talk briefly about the, the uh, framework that we use there. So physical inclusion and accessibility, uh, it, it, it goes beyond just making spaces where, you know, there's a wheelchair access. It's about um, welcoming, Learners, I'm reading the intent statement from the from the instrument by providing not only access to the space and its affordances, but also the opportunity to participate fully in the learning experience. So this goes beyond ADA. This means that you don't just marginalize the wheelchair spaces in the back of the classroom. That's just the legal requirement. You want people to not have to be in the back of the, I want people to have the same, uh, 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 you know, ability to participate in the learning experience as everyone else. You don't just put the left-hand tablet chairs along the, out, literally along the margins, but you integrate them in the classroom and so on. So that's the physical uh, inclusion. Now, these th three, uh, perspectives overlap, of course, they're not mutually exclusive. And so I think of them as lenses really for inclusion. Second one being cognitive inclusion. And this is the different ways and Susan's very, you know, has been very articulate about this in her work and today and the different ways that people experience learning. And for us, it's essentially applying universal design for learning, UDL, 
principles, but how do you translate UDL principles into physical space design? How do you, how, and, and, and so, you know, the, the key things there are, are um, about the different, mo giving students different modalities, the, you present information in different modalities, and you give students the ability to uh, express knowledge and learning it with different modalities. And, and some of that is, is just good uh, design with technology affordances. Um, and uh, um, so uh, th then the third area, which is, you know, maybe the most controversial or the most difficult or the most complex is we're called cultural inclusion. And this is really uh, based on people's social identities. And this is uh, based on social psychology research that says that, uh, that uh, when people experience identity threat or stereotype threat, they, don't, they, they literally, you know, it impacts their learning uh, uh, experience, their cognition it, and their performance. And there is, you know, good research on this. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, most of our spaces in higher ed, many of them were designed in some places at a time when some groups were actually not allowed to be there. So, so what are the legacies of those, of those designs? Um, and I'll just say briefly that, you know, the, the nub of the issue with cultural inclusion, I think is, is, um, about those social identity markers. Do you make spaces neutral? Like uh, uh, modernist architecture has tended to make neutral spaces, remove cult, uh, identity, social identity markers. Well, arguably there's no such thing as a neutral space, but, um, or do you, or what's the trade-off between that and adding markers of social identity? So really, uh, 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 ex you know, obvious examples that people have talked about is when, you know, if you're a student of color and you walk into a room and, you know, there's pictures all over the wall are all dead white males, you know, you, 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 do, I, do I belong here is what you ask. Do I feel welcome here? So that would be removing <laughs> social identity markers. But then what do you add? And, you know, people do things with artwork, people do things with uh, with uh, writing, with other verbal cues, with color, and so on. So that whole discussion about, I think we're in the very early stages of this, of figuring out how to do this um, uh, in spaces. And again, having your students be part of the discussion is, is, uh, is key, I think. Um, yep, yeah, so let me, let me turn, stop there and Go back to you, Susan. I, I totally agree with everything that you said, and I could sit and listen to you all day talk about that because it was really interesting. Um, so another aspect of this that I've been thinking a lot about is um, I know there's a focus on how to better use real estate all over campus, right? Um, so a couple of, of areas that I think that we could really do a great job with that um, create more inclusive environments are number one, wellness centers. So we spend a lot, there's a lot of money spent on uh, building these beautiful wellness centers um, and, and they're great. I mean, the, the intent is right, but I think that we can um, really bring more um, of our students um, into a community of well-being uh, that would help them. And a good example of this is the a wellness suite at the Lola and Rob Salazar Student Wellness Center at the University of Colorado, Denver. This facility is probably four or five years old but on the fourth floor of this facility, you know, you walk in and, and there's weight machine, you know, the typical wellness center. But when you go to the fourth floor, there is, the entire floor is dedicated to um, 
supporting students with food insecurities and housing insecurities. Um, and there's a food pantry. There is a nap room where students who may be commuter students or students who literally are living in their car in the garage, parking garage, um, so that they can attend class. It's a place for them just live, come in and just rest to take a nap. Um, and it's, it's a visible space and it just looks so natural um, to be there. Um, and there's counseling, financial counseling, um, services to help the students find housing and um, to get jobs and things like that. So rather than those services being, you know, disconnected to the whole intent of well-being, they are right there within the facility um, to help. And it was, I just thought it was such a great inspirational experience. So that's one example. The other example is, uh, and the, the beauty of this is, it is very much socialized um, throughout the campus. Uh, they all engage in um, food drives and things like that. So it's become part of the campus, right? So there's no stigma attached to um, someone going into the space and that kind of thing. Um, and the second one I would say is maker spaces, which are, um, I'm very passionate about my maker spaces. So I did a lot of research on maker spaces over the years. And a really great example, I think, of um, bringing inclusion to the maker space, um, which is important, by the way, because there is research out there um, related to gender bias. Um, cultural bias um, when going into maker spaces. And so at Florida State University, uh, a couple of years ago, they opened the Innovation Hub. The beauty of the planning of this building is that 23 departments across campus, 23 schools, were involved in the planning of this space from day one. Um, they are all part of the steering committee, so they have representation for the steering committee of the makerspace of the Innovation Hub, and each of the departments fund one or two student ambassadors to work at the Innovation Hub, and it is the most diverse group of young students that I've ever seen represented in a space. So that if you are um, a, a female, you know, whatever your insecurities were of going into maker spaces or innovation hubs, um, it is just so great to walk in there and see someone who looks like you, right? Um, whether it's cultural, um, whatever it is, uh, it's just great to see someone who looks like you. Um, and these students are there to help maybe facilitate workshops, to meet one-on-one, -on -one, help understand how to use equipment, uh, tool any of the tools of the space. And they really have started to build communities around this. Um, so I think those are opportunities for us to it, it, the, in, in for the most part, but those spaces already exist. So it's just really making them more inclusive and making sure that all students um, feel comfortable, feel welcome. So when you walk in the space, you think, wow, you know, I, I feel like I belong here, um, which I think is really important. So that, that was something I was very passionate about. And uh, Florida State is not that far from my home, and I've done a lot of work there. And when um, when we first, I, I did some very early work with them on that project, and to see it come to fruition and and how well they did in planning this was just so exciting. So I hope that's inspirational for um, other folks to be thinking about ways to really um, walk the talk um, in our. Goal. I bet you helped them pull that you sounds like you really helped them pull that off 
is such a wonderful example. And I think it's so difficult to, um, in my experience, those kind of cross-disciplinary, large cross-disciplinary efforts that truly have buy-in from the different stakeholders that you need on campus. It's just, I mean, you know, I don't think we probably don't want to get sidetracked into the politics of how you get this stuff done, but, you know, uh, the bureaucracies and higher ed are kind of arcane and siloed and, and uh, you know, the, like your wellness center, you know, those things are, you know, in many cases where there's faculty governments, faculty don't take those things seriously. They don't think that they're real things, uh, mm -hmm. that the whole student affairs uh, approach to the whole student is not a real thing. Right. Uh, they're just interested in their research and their academics. And so, yeah. you know, to get people to buy in and to integrate a wellness center with an academic, you know, building, you know, is right, is just already a challenge. Yeah. And then your description of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the maker space and in your, you know, um, you know, I think, you know, you're, you're so right about that maker spaces have a, uh, a mixed history there. They come out of the kind of the tinker, or the male tinker or techie culture a little bit. Yeah. And uh, so efforts have to be made, you know, to uh, change, the, change the culture. And we try to future-proof spaces. I mean, the argument that uh, I made when I... Uh, was uh, making these arguments on campus was was uh, what goes in the spaces is going to always be constantly changing and evolving. But we need the physical space for that face-to-face -face experience. And sometimes the face-to-face -face experience blends into the remote experience. We've seen these, you know, Zoom classrooms that there's people in the physical room and there's people remote. And we you know, wanted to design classrooms like that before, before COVID. Um, and, you know, we're, there's going to be mixed reality, uh, augmented reality things and so on. So all, all those things are constantly going to be evolving. But I think you're right. You know, what you really want is, um, is reconfigurable spaces and a lot of space uh, for uh, students in the learning space rating system. We assert, you know, square footage ideas. And I think those are those are valid because they allow you to do different types of teaching, and different types of experiences. Jeannie, that your LSC questions: What experiences do you want students to have, and what spaces afford those experiences? That's, you know, those are are, 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 are really the questions. What can people do in the space? And so, um, the. The, the basic questions are the same in 10 years, I think, as they are today, uh, which is what is best done in each medium when you look at, you know, blended experiences, remote, uh, electronic, digital, face-to-face. Uh, -face. And those questions are not going to change. The way in which they get expressed with different technologies, um, uh, uh, ways for students to make things in the space and, and ways for people to collaborate will shift. But anyway, that's one thought. And I would add to that, and this is me just being an internal optimist, is that the campus as a whole becomes more fluid, right? So the fluidity, the flow of being able to uh, learn remotely, learn on in a classroom, work remotely, work on campus. Um, and, and just the entire process of learning, I'm hoping that we will be at a point where the student experience is just more fluid for them and, and not that we can alleviate things that they should not be stressing over, right? that, that uh, they have enough to, to worry about in the learning process um, and how they're going to get a job. We don't have, that we can alleviate some of those obstacles. Um, 
for everyone. So that's sort of just my hope uh, that we can do that. See, I think that's fantastic because, and, and I would you just add to that, breaking down the distinction between formal and informal spaces really there, what, you know, I, I could see moving toward, there really aren't, these are classrooms and these are these other things. Uh, and these are where people live and these are where people have, you know, wellness and, you know, but where you can move stuff around and then you can suddenly that can be um, a classroom like experience with different sizes of people and, and so on. Because most learning takes place in informal spaces yeah. anyway. So I, that, I love that notion of um, the fluidity, the thinking of the whole campus as a learning environment. Yes, yes. I'll leave with um, a quote. Yeah. So um, this comes from Daniel Aguilar, who was part of the AACNU panel that I talked about earlier. And I just thought this was a great um, place for us to end our discussion. He says, part of our work in preparing a new generation of leaders is to work with our students to help them understand the value of diversity, equity, inclu and inclusion. And it's not only an important part of their realities and experiences, but as an asset to our decision-making and as an asset to our effective performance as individuals, as organizations, as nations, and as a world. So I thought that was, it was beautiful and I wanted to include it.